Welcome to the first uh, signaling theory lecture for Accounting 514. My name is Brian Knox. Uh, I want to get right into it, make it as precise as, and to the point as possible. Every time I start a class, though, I like to have the initial lecture kind of place us within the body of knowledge, within, within what uh, school of thought we're, we're going to be um, accessing all the information here. So we're going to start with the idea of economics. Uh, not not too extensive, don't worry, but I want to get a few things out of the way here. First of all, when, when I talk about economics, I, I think we have to start from a place of gratitude. Uh, we have to have some gratitude for being alive at the time that we're alive. A hundred or two hundred years ago, and definitely most any time prior to that, uh, half of us uh, in the class would likely be uh, dead from illness, violence, or accident. The other half of us would be twice as miserable as we are today with twice as much work to do just to stay alive and a small fraction of the benefit from each hour that we work. So let's be grateful for our, our frankly, uh, spoiled time that we are in history. And if we're willfully blind to that, we're going to do badly and think badly. And when we think of economics, we need to think about uh, how we humans have progressed in uh, these very ways about quality of life, about uh, ability to be at, to work productively uh, and and simply survivability uh, of of the human species. So those those kinds of advancements uh, we can really lay at the feet in large part or at least partially. I mean, we can debate about how much, but a, a good fraction of it of the of the credit goes to economics. Accounting is a, a branch of economics, and specifically, accounting claims uh, to f claims its its identity from information economics. It claims claims owner uh, citizenship of the information economics domain. So that's why we're going to be talking about signaling theory in this lecture and the next one. Uh, signals being information that's being conveyed. So in information economics, uh, the idea is that uh, instead of talking about the economics of a country as a whole, instead of uh, talking about uh, the, the pure consumer economics, uh, uh, so I went, I went macro, then I went micro here. Uh, instead of, of so macro country as a whole, inflation, monetary policy, fiscal policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, no, that that's that's not that's not of any concern of mine as an accounting uh, scholar. Uh, microeconomics actually that is some concern, but a subcomponent of microeconomics, what what a what a firm individual firm does, or what individual consumers do, and how they shape the supply and demand curves that are that are specific to that that firm and and that uh, that market the firm is serving, uh, there's some information transfer that's going on. That's that's really why uh, I get involved in microeconomics is because of the information. So as an accounting researcher, we're we're uh, our accounting information is is information. We're we're talking about information that has value, and therefore there's an economic uh, paradigm through which you could e evaluate the information. Well, how much information, how much value does the information have, and how much are people willing to spend for that information, or how valuable is information in terms of its credibility? Uh, we have we have a whole economics branch e evaluating information, and one of the fundamental presuppositions of this information is that there is private information, and we start to get the idea of information asymmetry. So let's let's try to try to uh, Rationalize that uh, through some real world, some some mundane examples. So we have uh, some classic games here. One is Guess Who, and Guess Who is an information game. So in Guess Who, you know, each player has this yellow card that you can see uh, facing facing him or her. So I have uh, looks like Maria facing me, and and he has I don't know what. There's a question mark on the back of that. Uh, and so I have to ask my my. Uh, other, the other person playing, my competitor or whatever you want to call him, looks like my son actually, or something. You know, based on the, the picture, that's how it's marketed. And so, oh, it's a family member. Um, I have to ask him or her some questions about the the yellow card over there, and say, well, that person over there is. But does the person have a big nose? Like, here's the example that they give: is the person wearing a hat? Uh, and by doing that, I can then flip. Down people who don't match the criteria, uh, the the answers, the information that 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 my my competitor here is is giving me, and then I can narrow down who exactly this is. I flip I flip the person the, the people down on my side of the board. Uh, we have the same same cast of characters on the red side of the board and the blue side of the board, and I can I can then flip down the people who I've I've, I've eliminated eliminated by my questions and he flips down the people that he's eliminated by his questions and eventually we're trying to narrow it'd be the first person to guess correctly who the other 
person's yellow card is. So there's a yellow card in the deck for each of the people uh, on uh, on the board here. All right, looks like what what one two three four five six seven eight by one two three three eight by three. So Twenty four possible uh, people. I I think if I'm counting the rows right here. So the 24 people that you could pull for your yellow card for each person. All right, so the point is is that the, the transfer of information, the asking of questions, is where all of the magic happens. Uh, there's, there's some luck in terms of guessing. You might have three people left and you just want to guess one of them. So, so be it, you know, there's, there's some element of that. Uh, but, but so much of the action is happening with how much information am I extracting from each question that I get. And since each question is dichotomous, they can answer yes or no, then the the optimal strategy for this is to get as close to 50% of your population as possible eliminated by your question. And so let's say I have half the people here with, a, use their example question here, a big nose. Well, if that's the case, then it'd be a good question to ask because whether the answer is yes or whether the answer is no, I am likely to eliminate half of the potential suspects and, and narrow down uh, who the yellow card on his side is much more rapidly. Uh, whereas there's there's this this wager that I'm making if I there's only one person for example this is the Robert here who ha who's blushing let's say is your person blushing well very likely the person's going to say no and if that's the case all I get to flip down the only information I extracted is that it's not Robert uh, there's a very small chance that it is Robert and I have just happened to guess Robert and we're getting very close to the idea of just guessing randomly of the 24. No, but better than that is to narrow it down as close to 50% as, po as possible. And if I could do that, if I could do that effectively, again, this 50% is because of the dichotomous answers. Each answer answer is, we, we information economists will call it, the, it partitions reality uh, by, by half. It, or, yes, yes. It partitions reality into two, two partitions. One partition in which uh, there's the, the person has a big nose, one partition in which the, per, per, the person does not have a big nose. Yes and no. And they are giving me an indication as to which reality we're living in. Does the yellow person, yellow card have uh, a, bi a big nose or does he not? And the closer I can get those two partitions to 50%, the, the, more, the, the more consistently I will be extracting the maximum value from each question. Because think of it this way, you have 24 cards. Okay, after one question, if I have, if I have successfully made it to 50%, I have eliminated 12 of the cards. After two questions, I am down to six cards possible. After three questions, I'm down to three. And then I have a one in three chance of guessing. So after three questions, I might have a one in three chance of, of guessing. Uh, if I were to successfully make each question eliminate 50% of the population in, in, in my thing, in my, my, on my side. So the idea here is, is we're trying to extract as much information from, from Information. I love this because it has all the elements of the elements of, of information economics. The, the traditional way we look at this. We have private information. I see my card, my yellow card. He sees his yellow card. We don't see each other's yellow card. There's a there's a dumb picture right here. I looked at earlier. Uh, right right here. Uh, don't play like this. Like he can clearly see if he just you know if he's at all looking, he can see that yellow card. This is not the way to play. They they stage this for the photo so they can get their family all more or less facing the camera. They didn't want dad's the back of dad's head here. I think. This is not the way you play. This is the way you play. It's private information. He see his card, I see my card. All right, that's enough of the game. Um, let's talk about Battleship. Uh, no. So with Battleship here, we have a bad strategy for Battleship, the way this person has played the game. So with Battleship, again, it's an information game. I have, uh, I can make my, I can make a shot. I can, I can take a shot on the opponent's board, which is displayed up here. So for each shot, if it's a miss, uh, I put in a white peg. If it's a hit, I put in a red peg. And so I have my ships on my board over here, my portion of the sea, set up as whatever arrangement I picked. This is a very interesting arrangement, likely to get some collateral damage, probably not advisable. Um, because when, yeah, when they hit, when they hit this boat, uh, no, let's say this boat right here, down here where my cur cursor is, um, they don't know which direction the boat goes. They very mu likely might hit, go, go north of that and, and hit this boat. And so now they have information on two different boats. Once they've sunk this boat, they say, wait, but this, this boat, this, this hit right here didn't correspond to a boat. And so then they're going to start saying, well, does it keep going up? Oh, look, they're going to go north of the B row and, and hit that. And then they're going to discover a new boat. So th this is a bad arrangement of, of your boats, but this is the first choice you make, is you, how do I arrange my boats so as to minimize the information that the other person is getting per hit that they, they uh, obtain. 
And then second information you, the second choice you make as far as information goes is as you're attempting to shoot, because this the other person has the same setup on his, if you've ever played Battleship before, the same setup on his side, his portion of the ocean uh, has the boats arranged however he wants, or he or she um, wants, uh, however he or she thinks is optimal to, to throw you off or to minimize the information you extract from each hit. Uh, and then up as a portrayal, uh, a, a model of your side right here, just based on the hits and misses that are coming through. And so with with this kind of a, of a, of a game, uh, I don't want to go through the math quite as, as in depth because it was nice and easy with guess who, because it's a dichotomous answer, yes or no. And it's a dichotomous answer here, uh, yes or no, but there's no way I can get the partitions to near 50%. I can't do that because there are only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, no, there, there are five here. One, two, three, four, five, five on the battleship. So 10, 14, 17. There are 17 hit squares and 10 by, uh, yeah, 10, 100 different squares. So there's a 17 out of 100 chance by random guessing that my shot will be a hit. And so what I want to do is I want to decrease the denominator as fast as possible. Let's look at it that way. Let's try to, try to analyze it that way. Um, I want to decrease the denominator. I want to take the number of possible squares that it could be out of commission as quickly as I can. And the way to do that is diagonally. You want to shoot diagonally. Uh, that's why I said I don't think this person did a good job because these, these, why, why shoot C5? After you've hit B5 here, C4 here, D5 here, C6 here, is there any chance a boat can be right there? No, here are the boats. Battleship with five squares. Oh, excuse me, uh, aircraft carrier with five shares, aircraft carrier with five shares, battleship with four, four squares, four dots, uh, whatever, the, the destroyer, I think, or the cruiser with three, submarine with three, and the patrol boat with two. There is no boat with one dot. You, you've already eliminated that from the denominator. You've already said, well, that's not one of the possible hits. It's not one of the possible squares for a hit. And so what I can do is if I, if I do it right, I make X's basically where I, I, I'm targeting, I shoot B1 and A2, and I have taken two hit, two two shots to eliminate three squares. One, two, three. Because it can't be A1. If these two are misses, I know it can't be A1. And then I can take more. I can do A4, B3, C2, and D1. And here I have taken one, two, three, four, five, six shots, and I've eliminated four plus three plus two plus one. Ten squares from the denominator. So uh, I've taken, again, uh, six shots, eliminated ten squares. And so the, the strategy here is to maximize the information I'm extracting with each shot that I take so as to, to minimize the time it takes for me to find all of their ships. Uh, then there's the question of, of tr there occasionally you can rule out things uh, with regard to once you've made a hit, let's say this is my first hit, I don't know which direction it's going. It could be north, south, east, or west. The boat, I know this, this square is, is a hit, but which way does the boat rest? Well, if I've already hit this square and this square, um, I know that if it's not the patrol boat, it's not going north, and I know that it's definitely not going west here. So I'm likely to target east and or south, and so I uh, those are those are higher probability shots. Every every boat could go east or south depending on what what I've built. In fact, I've already eliminated the, the patrol boat up here. Let's 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 just assume that. Uh, then I know it's not north. It can't uh, it can't be north. If it if it is north, it's also south. So if a submarine with a three three square hit, it's it's makes E5 a hit, then I'll also get a hit on G5. So the highest probability shot for me is this right here. And then if we're talking about the other boats that are possible, the the carrier, the destroyer, the cruiser, they also might extend further down. So I, again, there's 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 first of all eliminating as many squares as possible without shooting them, and then trying to figure out the highest probability shot that you have once you make a hit. Well, which direction does the boat go? Okay, so the, again, the, the, the bottom line is we're trying to get maximum value per shot that we make. All right, that is, that is, that is information economics and accounting information is information. And so we are in financial accounting providing information to uh, the financiers of the firm. We have the bankers, they want accounted, uh, audited accounting statements, financial statements, that's financial accounting. Uh, we have stock market, which are the owners of the firm through through stock instruments. They want uh, 
audited uh, financial statements, and then we have because we have stock exchanges that we want to run in a certain way within the United States, at the very least, we have certain rules in place that that govern uh, these financial statements and the auditing of them, so that as much as possible we have. Uh, actually, I don't want to. I don't want to gloss over that. So as much as possible, we have v reliable signals. So the auditing is is actually pretty critical. So I, I make make jokes about auditing and public accounting, and I I, I usually tease about busy season. Uh, I'm not going to be the first or the last one to do that. If that is your chosen career, get used to it. Uh, you're going to have lots of fun in busy season, and you will will have to make your peace with it. And so if I rib you a little bit about it, uh, it pro hopefully it doesn't get under your skin. Otherwise, maybe you shouldn't actually go into public accounting. Uh, because my ribbing is going to be the least of your concerns when you actually are spending 80 hours a week in busy season. That's the trade-off you make because auditing is essential. Uh, it's essential for the, the system to work because here we have a company, they're sending out a signal, and the question is, is the signal reliable? And that's when we get into signaling theory for this, this, uh, this lecture. This first lecture is going to be talking about costly signaling games. Now, uh, I, I started with financial accounting and I kind of skipped over the rest, and, and since we're in a managerial accounting class, I don't want to do that. So we keep going with the different branches of accounting. We have also tax accounting, and so the idea is that we have a government that has some some interest in in uh, understanding the the financial goings on within a, within the firm, so as to tax them, they want to confiscate money, so they want to know how much money is being made. They want a good signal of that, and so they well, tax accounting also includes audits because they want the signal to be as reliable as possible, uh, and then we have managerial accounting. And you might say, well, there is no auditing in managerial accounting, and so therefore it doesn't really fall under signaling theory. And uh, th there's there's some truth to that statement. There's no, It doesn't fall under it in the same way. But we have contracts and incentives. And that is that is one of the main thrusts of, of what I cover in my open cost accounting textbook here. I start with the idea of we that of the idea that firms gather this managerial accounting information with the interest of figuring out responsibility. Who is responsible? Who or what is responsible for our profits, so that we can get more of what's working and less of what's not? Uh, it's a company trying to uh, optimize itself, its its operations, understand what's going on inside itself, so that it can do better in the future. And you do want reliable signals there, and there are ways the signals can become unreliable. You do want reliable signals there, because your the future of the company depends on it the future expansion of the company, the future survival of the company. And so there are different incentives, but they do line, are different different motivations. I don't want to, I'm already using incentives in a particular way in this, in this lecture, so I, I don't want to mix that up. Let's call it motivations. There are different motivations for why you would want, uh, why signaling theory applies to managerial accounting and cost accounting, which I'm using synonymously, but they still end up with many of the same principles coming along. So no, there's no auditing necessarily, not required by law, but there, there is an interest in getting quality information, and the reliability of information largely depends on its costliness to, to the giver, to, to uh, its differential costliness among potential groups that we might be receiving the information from. All right, that, that's getting ahead of ourselves. Okay, so we talked about the gains. We've gotten the idea of signaling uh, of, of information economics, and uh, let's let's. We've also introduced the idea of information asymmetry. That's that's critical for information e econ uh, economics, that, or at least it's very typical that we start talking about private information. Maybe that's because that's how the world is set up. I know certain things from my experience or from my domain that others can't know. As soon as we get into a division of labor, that's going to arise. And as soon as we get past Stone Age bartering, bartering we get a division of labor. And so the artisan in the medieval craft shop knows more about those crafts than anybody else in town. And so he or she is the expert in uh, that, that realm. So he has private information in that case. So theoretically, uh, there, there are some forgeries or some, some poor quality uh, uh, artifacts that could escape his, his domain that if the others aren't aware of it, could, could fool him and they pay him more than it's worth. So that's, 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 that's information economics in, in the bartering, in, in, a, in a very primitive economic system compared to ours. And, and what, again, the idea is once you get a division of labor, naturally private information is going to arise. You're going to have people who know more because their division of the labor gives them experience in that area more than you or more than their supervisor or more than the buyer. And so you have to deal with the economics of extracting that private information. Well, what do I have to do to get you to tell me truthfully 
whether this is a forgery, whether this is high quality, whether this is a good worker, a bad worker, I, I, the truth. How can I extract the truth from you, the, the private information that you have, especially when it's in your economic interest otherwise to lie to me, to take advantage of, of this information asymmetry and consume it for your benefit. <clears throat> We, I also mentioned a couple things that, I'll, we'll, that we'll come up later, the idea of partitions, uh, that once, when the information usually gives us, gives us an idea, no, let me phrase it differently. We, we partition reality. There are many different possibilities. This is kind of a, if it helps you, you can think of this whole multiverse idea going on in, uh, in Marvel movies, like Doctor Strange, if you're familiar with that one, uh, in the, the, a few years back. Uh, or, or there's an actual scientific theory that this comic book version is based on, but the idea being that there, there are, that this is the theory, and I'm not, not, not promoting it or anything like that. I'm just saying this is the theory that some people subscribe to, that uh, there are this near infinite number of possible realities, and we happen to be in one of them that has turned out this particular way. Great, so be it. Let's take, let's extract from that the idea of possible realities. And that is what we're talking about by partitions. So if I come up to a situation and it's, it's you and somebody else talking, there are a good number, number of possible realities that could fit, could, could fit that fact pattern. This could be your husband or wife. This could be a friend. This could be somebody who's trying to rob you. Each of those, those realities in which I, I encounter you and another person talking, uh, they have different things that I should do. I, I have an interest in knowing which reality I'm in. Which, which partition of reality I'm in. Those are very different situations. And so I might try to extract information. I might try to read signals to extract information that will help me understand the probability of me being in each of these partitions. So if you two are fighting, uh, that might help me understand, or the na and the nature of your fighting as well, that might help me understand uh, more likely which, which area you're in. Clearly your spouse's. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Again, the nature of the fight might, might, might make a difference. Give me your purse is not necessarily something that, uh, that uh, spouses say to each other uh, on, on the regular. So uh, we have the partitions of reality, and we have, I, I also said a word that is important for signaling theory, uh, probability. So we're, it's a very probabilistic game. Uh, that was, I was implicit, at least, in my talk about the two, the two literal games that we're talking about. Uh, it, the economic games with relation to information economics are almost always probabilistic in their nature because that's what reality is. Well, if I have a few pieces of information about you and this person sitting next, standing next to you, you're talking, um, I can, with certain level of, of certainty, a certain level of certainty, draw a conclusion as to which partition of reality I'm living in. Oh, this is a friend, they, because they're talking like friends. Um, yes, that's possible. It's also possible that this person is is a uh, kind of evaluating you as a potential mark and uh, so speaking very friendly so there's a small possibility that this person is still there to rob you or maybe you and your spouse just speak in a way that's that's uh, more uh, more that sounds very similar to how friends speak uh, or maybe I uh, maybe I don't have enough enough information or foreknowledge to differentiate well between those two you know there's a lot of possibilities here but the idea is the information that I've gotten has changed the probability of each outcome so uh, that's that's going to get us into Bayes' theorem, which we'll talk about later. The priors that we have coming into it, we have some new information. Bayes' theorem helps us update that the probabilities of different partitions we might be in, and and that's this this process that we go through. But let's let's go back to to the idea of costly signaling games because I think that I wanted that I want to focus on that. In fact, we might not talk about Bayes' theorem until the next next lecture. I'm not 100 percent sure what goes into each one. Uh, I want to do two on signaling theory, and this one I, I know I want to call. Uh, I want to get costly signaling games, and the next one I want to get costless signaling games, uh, which I think will be shorter. So I'm going to put Bayes' theorem. I think I'm leaning towards putting Bayes' theorem in the next one and getting into to how exactly this all works. Let's let's talk about costly signaling games. And so let's let's start uh, let's start by talking about an, an economist named Brian Kaplan and a book specifically that he has called The Case Against Education. Now you might think it'd be anathema for me to bring up a book called case against education which is with the subtitle why the education system is a waste of time and money in a upper division or excuse me in a, in a graduate level class uh, but the graduate level class is about economics and uh, information economics job market signaling specifically the topic of this lecture and that is what that book is about so his his general thesis in this book is that 
a high proportion. I, I believe if I if I remember from when I, I looked at the book before, I read the book before. Um, I believe he says eighty percent is what he thinks it explains. That a high percentage of our of the benefit of education is explained simply by signaling. So let's talk about what that what that means. And he says and he says therefore you could learn. So sorry, what he's saying is is very very much the idea that higher education is very inefficient as a way to gain human gain human capitals, human capital, capitals, <laughs> as a way to gain human capital, as a way to build your your knowledge and what you can actually do. This is this is honestly there's a, there's a reflection of this in in accounting the idea that uh, a lot of people will tell you or at least as some people will tell you that oh well you know what you, you get the degree you get the CPA but that that's great and all what you really learn is when you start working on the job there's there's some, a kernel at least of truth to that and perhaps there's a lot of truth to that uh, the debate is where it falls is that is that so true that education is 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 uh, a kind of a footnote. Your education is a footnote in what what you eventually end up with, and it's all about your experience. And we're we're very much a trade, which is fine. I'm not it's not I'm not saying that derogatorily or counting it as a trade. Um, or is it is it just a, a on the fringes, on the margins? Yeah, I guess you, you, your experience is more is most important. But you know what that 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 education can make a big difference. Uh, you know how what's the percentage of of human capital effect on your career in accounting? So that's 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 the question. Is how much? No, how much is is the effect of education on, on human capital. And so his, his, I believe what he says is that he thinks signaling the signaling aspect of education accounts for 80% of its value in terms of what you're being paid post-education versus without education. Uh, and I, 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 interesting, I, interestingly, I, I read the book and I found it pretty compelling. I, I don't know if that percent is what I agree with. Uh, I haven't done enough to really put forward a percent of my own. But the idea that it, it accounts for a significant percentage, this so-called sheepskin effect, the idea that um, the day before you get your diploma, you're worth a certain amount, and then once you get your diploma, which used to be written on sheepskin at some point in time, so therefore it's called a sheepskin, your diploma, you suddenly shoot up in value. Like you could get hired by uh, an accounting firm, but you, you are one day away, effectively, from a degree, and they will pay you significantly less than if you had that extra day. Is that extra day actually going to, to mean you learned a lot. Is that la we we pack in oh don't you know yeah that that's the, that's the conspiracy isn't it we 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 professors we pack in all the information on the last day that's why it, it shoots up so much in value and he's saying no the sheepskin effect is uh, is a symptom of it being mostly a signaling game and so let's talk about a signaling game uh, the idea being with a signaling game we can't directly ask the private information like guess who you can't directly ask well who's the person I don't, wait. That's not allowed, or the person is unlikely to tell us, or they're likely to lie. And so in this case, the signaling game is about job uh, employers, about employers seeking employees of a certain type. So say I'm an employer, and I want what kind of type, what kind of workers do I want? Well, it'd be good if they showed up. So I want workers who show up. It'd be good if they know what they're doing, so I want competent workers. It'd be good if they're good team players, so I don't want antisocial workers. Uh, it'd be good if uh, they had, down the road at least, some creativity to come up with, with new re revenue streams or to improve our current revenue streams. So I want some, some people high in openness, some, some people who are very creative. Uh, so those, those are, right off the bat, I can tell as an employer, I, I, there, there are four different characteristics right there I might, I might be looking for, of, of various utility, and depending on where I am, in where, what my market is, and what, what kind of job it is, they might vary in terms of, of what all it is. Uh, which of those is important? If there are, are others, perhaps it's a very, well, if, I, if I have a very labor-intensive place to work, uh, physical ability is going to be very important. Uh, for most office jobs, they have that that little disclaimer at the end. Or any of them, they have this little disclaimer at the end saying, "Oh, in this job, you might have to weigh, uh, lift uh, up to 25 pounds." You know, you know, because paper paper it adds up, and sometimes sometimes things get lost under the printer, so you have to lift up the printer. I know it's really hard. It's very labor-intensive in the office. Uh, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. But the point is that for different jobs, there might be different underlying characteristics that you want in your employees. Now, that means that means that uh, sometimes these these are things that you can't ask for or that are private information. So it might be it might be illegal to ask for it. For example, uh, there might be a certain personality traits that uh, you might get in legal trouble or at least at least risk legal trouble if you ask about. And 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 even if you could ask about them. If it's private information, by definition, you know, in, in, with information that by how we define private information, and the idea of information asymmetry within it, information economics, what that means is that it's it's something that 
the the holder of the private information could choose whether or not to disclose it honestly. And so, let's say, for example, uh, I have a job and it requires a certain level of intelligence, a certain level of IQ, basically, uh, to do it effectively. You know, is anybody going to say when they're applying for the job if they really want the job? Oh yeah, no, no, I'm not. I don't. I don't meet the IQ requirements. No, oh, they might not. Uh, you might have a number of people, at the very least, who 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 maybe don't meet the intelligence requirements, but can successfully portray themselves as meeting them, or successfully convince you in the interview process um, that that they they do. There there might be people who who can convince you that they're a hard worker, that they um, what were the, some of the things I said earlier, uh, that they arrive on time, so they they they're going to be there present, uh, that. That uh, their their I talk about openness and creativity, you know that perhaps they can they can tell you, they can send you a, a signal that oh yes I I I have those tra those traits. So the idea is you have these these underlying traits underlying traits within people that will materially affect their job, and you're trying to extract the information from that person as to whether they truly are of a type that that will most benefit you and them in the job. And so, well, that's a, that's a critical part. Um, let me let me step back there for a second. That will that will benefit you as the employer in the job. Uh, what it does to them, let's let's hold that off for a second. Uh, I think I think often it'll it'll benefit them as well. But but let's hold off. That's not not a critical component of the of the idea here. So we have costly signaling games in which uh, instead of the what's called cheap talk of oh yeah I'm I'm intelligent enough for your job or I have the skill set for your job or I have uh, the underlying personality traits that will help me be successful in your job. Instead of this, this cheap talk, which may or may not be accurate, of people just claiming to have this private, uh, claiming their private information is a certain way, um, you you have some sort of a a signal that you are trying to read that will will disproportionately be more economical to obtain. For those who have that underlying characteristic, education is the classic example of this. There are others, but education helps us put through the paces of what a costly signal is, and it, it also we're going we're to apply that to to managerial managerial academy. That's why we're talking about it. But education. Uh, the idea is is that if you have certain characteristics, and let's let's take two. I think two, in particular, are those that that education seems to. Uh, target and and at least is argued to be a signal for. We have uh, the trait of conscientiousness, which is the tendency to be industrious and work hard, and a general intelligence, uh, IQ. So the trait of conscientiousness, um, specifically about the industriousness portion of it, it has a number of different different uh, uh, activities and and uh, uh, predispositions that that fall under trait conscientiousness in personality theory, but. One of them is industriousness, the idea that uh, you're going to plan ahead, you're going to uh, work hard on, on the things you do and meet deadlines. So those are traits that are necessary to complete, uh, specifically we're talking about college degrees. Uh, um, high school likely has the same thing, but I, I'm mostly going to be using the, uh, the, the, mostly going to be using as my example a college degree. The idea is you incur a cost to complete the degree, the, all the work that has to be done. And so it is the, the, the argument, at the very least, the, the signaling argument is, if it is disproportionately easier for people who just have a tendency to uh, show up on time, to work hard on things, to meet deadlines, to complete a college degree, if it's easier for those kind of people, the industrious, conscientious people, to, to complete a, con uh, a college degree, uh, and then also the idea of IQ. If it's easier for somebody who has a higher IQ to complete a college degree, then it is less costly for them to incur that signal. And so, therefore, you would expect that signal to be in higher percentages among that group. Let's go back to guess who. The idea is you're trying to extract information about this underlying person by asking us or no questions about about things that are not directly who is this person. You're trying to find other signals that will help inform this private your your assessment of the of what the private information is that the other person has. And so we, we're not directly giving an IQ test. We're not directly uh, somehow measuring, if you could, how well they show up for work on time. Uh, at least usually not. 
I guess if they're late to the interview, that that's one indicator potentially. But but usually we don't get that many indicators to show conscientiousness. But the, if the idea behind behind this uh, signal is, hey, uh, if they completed a college degree, that was that's going to be cheaper on them in terms of their commitment, in terms of their ability to do it, if they are a conscientious and b intelligent. That makes it a costly signal, and if if the disparity between those who are conscientious and those who are not, and those who are intelligent and those who are not, if the disparity between the costs one incurs in terms of the work one has to do, if the disparity is high enough, we get what is called a separable equilibrium. The idea being that these two types will separate automatically to a discernible level. They'll they have they have significant enough dif, significantly enough different dif, a significant enough difference in their cost curves that they will uh, make different choices. On average, those who are lower in conscientiousness, conscientiousness and lower in intelligence will, will forego the costly signal because it costs more to them than, than it's worth to them. Because they, they say, say I, I have a hard time turning things in on time. I have a hard time uh, grappling with abstract concepts. Uh, you know, I have lower intelligence, a lower IQ. Well, if that's the case, if that's the case, and again, assuming that that college is a decent, uh, it does have this disparity that, that that it is easier, it is effectively measuring this, uh, then then I, I I look at what I'm likely to get from a college degree, and I look at the costs, which are higher because of my my personality traits, these underlying traits that the employer is going to be looking for later, that they can't direct at, directly ask about, and I say to myself that that doesn't add up. I'm not going to go through that. Or if I do, I'm going to fail. And if I if I convince myself to, I'm going to soon, hopefully, realize this isn't worth it. I'm going to I'm going to drop out. And so, the the theory of costly signaling is, you're you're not necessarily looking at the college degree because it's made people especially smart because they're professors. You know, except maybe me the exception, of course. I'm teaching you lots of important things, but you're not necessarily looking at the college degree because their professors taught them a bunch of things that improved their human capital, as in their actual capabilities. But you're looking for it as a sifting mechanism, as a way to say, well, those those who don't have the traits that we want, the underlying traits that we want, likely, not always, but likely, probabilistically, did not undergo this extra training, this educational signal. And those who who do have the traits probabilistically did, because of how it, it the, the costs will line up for them individually. Not 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 to me, the employer, but to, to the individual student who is making the choice, or the, per, the prospective students who are making, who's making the choice of, to, of going to get the college degree or going to get an additional college degree. And we see uh, one of the things this does is sometimes, it, it depending on the, the quality of signal, it can create a little bit of an arms race in terms of people uh, who, who are at the edge who might have a little bit lower intelligence or conscientiousness than the employer is actually looking for, but not enough to dissuade them from undergoing the signal. They, they go ahead and they go undergo the signal. And so sometimes what will happen is you get you get a, a race upwards in terms of what is a, a meaningful signal because employers are, are looking for where the point of distinction is. And colleges also have financial incentives and they want to increase the number of people who go there. And so they're going to decrease the amount of conscientiousness and intelligence needed they have incentive, I should say, to do that, to decrease the conscientiousness and and uh, intelligence, if those are the two traits we're looking at, needed to complete a college degree because they want to widen the prospective revenue pool or the prospective uh, market. Broaden it out. Well, we want we want more and more people because, you know, conscientious, conscientiousness is, is, is normally distributed among the population. So if we're going to increase the number of people who are willing to come to college, we need to expand it out. Uh, and, and increase pe include people who might might otherwise have some difficulty uh, completing college. Uh, likewise with intelligence. Well, let's make sure we get those people who, who might have di more difficulty with intelligence. Let's get their revenue dollars too. And then the employer says, wait, 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 that, that's that's weakening my signal. Uh, you you you've weakened the signal. So now now I've got to stop looking at who has a, an undergraduate degree. I've got to start looking at who has a graduate degree. Now, to a degree, that's that might be part of the story in accounting. It, it, I I remember being on the job market, um, oh, you know, talking about a decade or more ago, talking to employers in in public accounting, potential employees in public accounting, and elsewhere, 
And I remember I would often be able to spot this line of demarcation. When I would talk to partners, they often had an undergrad degree, and that was it. When I would talk to people below them, maybe a little past the manager level, but, but definitely once you got past down down the, the, the hierarchy of the public accounting firm past manager level, um, they almost always, or the, ba- the a larger percentage of them at the very least, had a graduate degree, had a master's in accounting specifically. Now, part of that is is the shift in states pushing for 150 credit hours as as the requirement, whereas before, to, to, to take the CPA exam, whereas before it was 120 credit hours, uh, or at least to be certified. Some, some states allow you to start taking it after 120, and then you can't be certified fi- uh, in, in, with finality until after 150, uh, depends state to state. But almost all the states, if, if not all of them, have now moved to 150 as the, as the, uh, the standard. So 30 extra credit hours, which is where a 30 credit hour accounting degree, a master's in accounting, has propped up. Now, we in the, in the college world are not complaining about this, of course. That's an extra revenue stream. That's extra people we get to talk to. Extra, you know, me, I get extra employment or, or extra job security, whatever the case may be. Somehow it's, it's improving my situation. Um, but the question is, is it good for you? Is it good for the employers? You, the student, you, you and the employers. Um, well, there are a few questions there. First of all, we made, we made some assumptions. We've assumed, uh, at least my, my hypotheticals here, have assumed that Brian Kaplan's case, that there's, there's a predominant purpose of signaling in college education, is accurate. We've assumed that. Maybe it's not. Maybe he's overstated how, how high a percentage of the, the college degree is actually about signaling and how much of it is about improving human capital. So I'm sure you're in the thick of it right now. I'm sure, I hope, you can look at your classes and say, oh, well, I did learn this. I did improve my human capital. I learned this technique from XYZ class. And if that's not the case, so be it. Maybe the, that class hasn't come along for you yet. Or or I'm the, that class, of course. Uh, so having some fun here. Uh, and so so there's there's that, that that aspect of it to it. There, there may be more human capital improvement than we're letting on. Uh, and... Le- the other thing is, it, like I said, it's partly that's part of the story. Potentially, this arms race to improve, to 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 make the signal more distinguishing. Uh, that's one of the reasons, likely, that you went to get your master's degree is because the CPA is a is a gold standard of, of sorts. It is a costly signal. It is more difficult for those who don't have the underlying qualifications that people generally look generally look for in public accounting and in a number of er- other areas of accounting to obtain. A CPA. Then, for those who don't, then uh, it's more costly. With, how do I set that sentence? <laughs> it's less costly to obtain a CPA if you have the underlying characteristics that people are looking for in accounting. I'll say it that way. Less costly to you. You have to study less for it. You have more chance of success at each each juncture of each each section of the CPA exam. And so, in order to to make that CPA even more uh, selective and and qualifying as a signal. A lot of states have, have added this 30 degree requirement, 30 credit hour requirement, effectively requiring a master's degree or the equivalent. And uh, separately, a number of employers have started to look for that as well. When I talk to employers nowadays, uh, there generally is the statement that at the margins at the very least, they enjoy having students with a master's degree. They, they want to see that because it's an additional hurdle. We, the college, have taken effectively some of the sifting and done it for them. We've, we've, uh, when we graduate a master's student, in order for the master's student to successfully graduate, they have to be able to read a lot. There's a lot of reading in, ma- in the, the master's in accounting degree. Uh, they have to have the ability to jump through the hurdles of additional technical uh, skills. They have to, usually they have to work a little more closely in, ter- in teams. Uh, they, they, is, there's generally how do I say this? There's a zeitgeist of cooperation that's higher in the master's degree than in the bachelor's degree. That's at least my observation. When I get in the classes with the undergraduate degree, uh, there tend to be more disagreeable people who who uh, want to fight me on everything. And if that's if that's if that's honest intellectual inquisitiveness, I welcome it. Unfortunately, it's not always that. It's sometimes it's simply. Uh, disagreeableness. I, I don't want to cooperate with you. I want 
I want to prove how smart I am. And I want to run the classroom. Sometimes I get that in the undergraduate degree. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm happy to discuss things and, and hear opposing points of view. And there's a possibility I am either wrong in something or, or that I am portraying it in a way that is oversimplifying it too much. And I, I'm happy to have somebody from the outside of, of my field effectively, which is what an under, undergraduate student is. You know, they're, they're coming into the field, but they're not yet in the field. Uh, uh, if, I, if I can say this in a way that I, I know this word is neutral, but some people might, might not. I, I hope I, you understand this. I, I'm using the word neutrally. A naive person, naive to the field, so new to the field. If I, if I can get correction from a, a neophyte, a, a, a person naive to the field, sometimes they ask questions that I don't know to ask because I'm, I've gone down this road long enough. I have uh, what Chip and Dan Heath call the curse of knowledge. I, I, it's hard for me to put myself in the shoes of somebody who's just coming into the field or to think of what questions would I ask if I hadn't already gone down this mental rabbit hole 5,000 times and therefore have the, the neuronal paths in my brain well-worn. Oh, when I see this, I do this. When I see X, I, see, I do Y. When I, when I see Z, I do A. And sometimes the, I've made assumptions in those things, and I, I'm happy to have people combat me on this. Okay, I, got, I went down that, that, that tangent with the idea that there's this feeling of cooperation. When you get to the master's degree, most people who get there have realized that fighting with the professor over things that aren't important is counterproductive. Um, I do I do get a higher percentage of I think pushback based on intellectual curiosity at the master's degree level, in part because uh, those who get into the master's degree and are sticking with it uh, generally proportionally proportionally they'll have a higher level of intelligence. And it requires that there are their entrance requirements that that suggest that in fact to get into the graduate degree, you have to have an undergraduate degree that, that has, meets certain requirements, which already screens you a certain a certain degree. Uh, people often, you know, it's interesting, uh, right here is, is one of the Ivy League names, although it's, it's referring to their press, but the point is, the Ivy League, oftentimes what they're doing is uh, the, the, the primary source, according to signaling theory, the primary source of their value actually is occur, occurs before the freshman day of class. They are sifting out those who who don't have spectacular resumes. Uh, and and that's, that's been the basic idea of, of how signaling theory interprets these elite institutions that, that you know what, honestly, they, might te they could sit you in a classroom and teach you nothing, but if they still serve that role of, of selectivity, if they're still very selective in who gets into the program, uh, either, either intentionally or, or simply uh, as, some, as some byproduct, then, then employers can, can look at that degree and say, ha, huh, there it is. It's, it's a signal I can use for the underlying traits that are being selected for by that institution. All right, so I, I think I've gone through a part tangent, part explanation of, of signaling theory and how it works with education. Uh, the idea here it hinges on the costliness of it being differential among two groups. So you're trying to partition reality and saying, okay, that I could either be dealing with an, a potential employee who is of the low category or of the high category, whatever dimension we're talking about, conscientiousness, intelligence, um, their ability to lift more than 25 pounds, you know, whatever it is, uh, low versus high. I, I for some reason, uh, it's, it's difficult for me to directly ascertain that before I hire this person for the job. Afterwards, I'm going to get more information. I'm going to get signals over time as they deliver that tell me whether or not this person meets those requirements. Uh, and sometimes employers take chances and they, they just, well, I, I think he might, he or she might have these these qualifications, these, these underlying uh, characteristics that, that we want, I'm taking a chance. And then they are proven right or wrong over time as they gather more and more information about the employee. But generally, we're talking about whether there's a differential probability uh, of the signal being undertaken that differentiates specifically on those traits that we're looking for. All right, I think I've repeated that several times because it is it is critical. Now, I, I mentioned a key term that's important for us in, in in economics: this idea of a separable equilibrium, and that that idea means that uh, the the two groups will settle on different answers to the question. It's separable. You can you can look at the answer to the question and and make a, and and have a a significant difference in the probability that you're dealing with one reality versus the other, the partitions of reality. Well. Based on this person's background, it's more likely 
that this person has lower consciousness or lower intelligence or whatever. Is it for sure? No, no. It's it, it's probabilistic guess I'm making. But as an employer, I'm trying to increase my my um, my revenue and decrease my costs. I'm trying to increase my profits overall, and so therefore I'm going to take what probabilities I can. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use the signal to improve my chances. And so yeah, that's why that's 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 why uh, the the. The, the, the game of who gets who qualifies for jobs has uh, changes over time because these signals increase and decrease in their effectiveness and what they signal and they, they change into who is able to, to accomplish them and they're looking for these separable equilibrium and some of them prove to work well some of them prove to work well for a short time and then stop working the opposing view is a pooling equilibrium and that is where it's it's there's not enough of a difference between low and high types those with low conscientiousness and high conscientiousness there's not enough of a difference between those two groups for uh, it, to, it to meaningfully differentiate between uh, different realities that we, that we exist in. So the two, both groups will effectively pool on the same answer. They'll pool to the same point. They'll say, you know, if, if, if there really isn't enough of a distinction between who can get through or who is selected for college, for example, um, then, then both those who have the traits that the employer is looking for, and those who don't will take the college degree and complete it. And so it becomes a less, less meaningful signal because the costs have changed, because uh, the, the costliness of it to those who are low type has changed. And the lack of costliness of it for those who are high type has, has changed, or one or both. So what I wanted to do, last, the last thing I want to do in this lecture is, is close the loop on, on kind of applying the education example here uh, to to the, the more general idea of managerial accounting. Uh, so where where costs where signaling games come into play in private information is largely in the idea of the agent principal relationship. So the principal of a company is the person who owns the company or the people who own the company, like stockholders in the case of a publicly owned company, uh, a small group of people in the case of a more closely held company, an owner, just one owner, uh, a bank if the bank has part ownership of some in some way. Uh, Depending on the, the relationship between the two, they might have some sort of a, an interest that can that can transfer from debt into into equity ownership stake, and then we have the agent. And so everybody basically from the CEO down is an agent, a cascade of agents. So the board in a publicly owned company, publicly owned company, the board of directors uh, usually puts together a committee that that hires the hiring committee hires the CEO, but they in, in turn decide who stays or who is hired. As those below them, uh, getting into into other managerial positions, maybe they, maybe they have the CEO has some say in other C-suite positions, uh, or or something something a little below that. We get into to regional and departmental heads and 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 their staff, and they say have a say in people who are, are hired in their area, all the way down to the low lowest level employee who's hired uh, to take out the trash on weekends. But they're deciding who is who they're going to hire. Uh, just in this cascade of, of agents. And the idea is being an agent. So the CEO is an agent to do the things the board of directors is not doing themselves. So the board of directors is represented for this, the stockholders and they're going to try to represent their interests or that's the, the theory anyway, right? They hire a CEO who will execute their vision of, of how the firm can, can be uh, successfully managed. What the most profit is that they can get from the firm for in the interest of the, the stockholders who own the firm. And that agent then hires sub-agents, sub-contracts basically out the rest of the firm. Hires sub-agents who will manage well how this department will, will best bring in profitability and how this department will best bring in profitability and how this department will best bring in profitability. Hires a you know, chief accounting officer, chief, hires a, a controller, hires a, a chief information officer uh, or, or the department head over information ser services and information technology. So they hire these people, giving them these sub responsibilities that will that ultimately all those put responsibilities put together influence the profitability of the firm. Okay, so the problem is is that there is a mismatch here, and there is endemic to this. There is a, a case for uh, private knowledge. There's always going to be private knowledge in these kinds of instances. If not, uh, then it means that the board of directors is just doing the job of the CEO, and the CEO is just doing the job of the department heads that he or she's hiring. And the departments are just doing the job 
of the people below them. Like I said at the beginning, I, I made I was I was a little too too specific in my statement. I said whenever there's a a uh, division of labor, uh, information asymmetry it comes up. It, it it occurs because division of labor means people are spending their time differentially. One person is specializing in one thing, one person is specializing in another thing, and therefore they're going to have this knowledge that accumulates based on their specialization, and that's going to be specific to that person. It's not, it's not just because of division of labor. I, I was, what I said was true, but it's, it's too narrow. It, honestly, unless it, information asymmetry is endemic to life, it occurs at all times because you don't spend your time on the same things that the next person does in any way. Unless we have a, a Star Trek-like mind meld, you will not have the same information as the, ne the person next to you. The thing is, most times it's trivial. The economics of it are not that interesting. If I know less about Rick and Morty than you do, that doesn't make much difference unless we're having a, a critical conversation about Rick and Morty. And and so it's it's that is an information asymmetry, but it's it's trivial. It doesn't make an economic difference. In the economic realm, in areas that are non-trivial, uh, divisions of labor create these information asymmetries, and they tend to be material in nature. They tend to be important for the economics. Uh, and there, there might be other instances in which we have information asymmetries that are material and and important for the economics. But I, I, I honed in on the idea of a division of labor because it, it explains a lot of what we're going for with managerial accounting. So the agent, the CEO, has an incentive to an incentive to signal to the board of directors that he or she is doing a great job because that will a keep him or her employed, b help him or her get his his or her bonus. So I, as the CEO, would want to signal to the board of directors. At the same time, I also have the natural human tendency to have a disincentive to exert any effort. Uh, if I have a choice between, well, I could get my bonus and sit on the couch every every Saturday, or I could get my bonus and be hard at work every Saturday. Of those two, the natural human tendency is to, to have a disincentive for effort uh, and, and not want to exert effort and choose, well, I'd rather relax on the couch. And I, let's put that a different way. I have a number of things that bring me joy. My job's one of them, or, or at least it brings me something I, I enjoy, which is money to sustain myself and my life. But I have other things I enjoy too. And, and those things compete. So maybe Saturdays I'm not sitting on my couch. Maybe Saturdays I'm working on a project with a son or a daughter that I have. Maybe I'm, I'm spending time with my family camping. So maybe it's not me consuming it lazily. Maybe there are other things that bring me joy in life or that are of utility to me that are, have competing interests. And, and guess what? That, 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 pres that does create a disincentive of effort towards my job because these competing interests want some, at least some of my time. And so if I can choose to make Jimmy's baseball game or not make Jimmy's baseball game and either way get the bonus, I'm going to choose to make Jimmy's baseball game and get the bonus. So there's a disincentive for effort. So the CEO is at the same time trying to minimize, at least to a degree, his or her effort and maximize his or her chances of signaling to the, the board uh, that he's done a good job, he or she's done a good job. So we have this interesting signaling game. Now, the CEO knows better than the board whether or not he or she has actually done a good job. There's information asymmetry there. And so we have all sorts of effort in, in, the, in the realm of, of incentives to draw up contracts that, that optimally induce the CEO to honestly report. You know, if I have to honestly report whether or not I've done a good job, then they can choose to keep me if I've done a good job or fire me if I haven't. And so, and so now, now by honestly reporting, I, I have a, a interests aligned. And now, now if I want to keep my job and I want the bonus, I have to do a good job if I have to honestly report the job I've done. And so the contracts have a number of different mechanisms by which they try to induce this. Uh, so there's a whole realm of, of talking about uh, equity incentives, that is, say, stock options. It, that, that directly aligns the CEO's incentives with the firm, with the stockholders, because it makes the CEO into a stockholder, or effectively into something approaching a stockholder. You know, the vesting requirements and so on and so forth can change some of that. It can it can make it a little bit more complex than than just making him or her a run-of-the-mill stockholder. But the general gist of it is, 
you're, you're doing what we call selling the, the firm to the agent. So how do you fix the principal agent problem of information asymmetry? The agent may be having different incentives, uh, perverse incentives, sometimes called, uh, that, are, that run contrary to the, the principal. You just make the agent into part principal. Uh, and on the other line, that's why you sometimes get, get stock options well within the firm, not just the CEO, but they have certain s stock incentives all the way down to sometimes lower level employees to give them some buy-in in terms of making, making them their interests align with the overall interest in making the firm more profitable. Oh, well, that will increase the value of the stock options that I have or the, the incentives that I have through stock. So there's an equity portion of this, and there are a number of performance measures as well. Okay, well, there's a threshold you have to reach in terms of performance before you get your bonus. Uh, that we have a balanced scorecard. And I think, I expect to talk about balanced scorecards in a later lecture, lecture but that, that, that falls under the idea of a way to improve the honesty of the signal that the CEO or the, the, the managers, the agents within the firm, are giving to the, the principal. So reporting on, on his or her effectiveness in a more in a more multifaceted way requires more multifaceted effort thank you for for listening uh, i'll pick this back up in the next lecture